see if you have the same temperature reading. If it is increasing in temperature, then I would say, yes, you need to investigate. If the temperature is decreasing, then you know what? Leave it be. Give it some more time. Come back, check it again. If the temperature is decreasing, probably good to say that you don't have to worry about a rekindling. Enchanted Sky Media. Media. From Los Angeles, this is Code 3, the Firefighters Podcast, hosted by award-winning journalist Scott Orr. Code 3 features interviews with leading members of the fire service discussing firefighting strategy, tactics, and other topics you need to know more about. Now, here's Scott. That's right, and I will not let Parkinson stop me. Thank you for joining me again here on another edition of Code 3. You are listening to the show for and about firefighters. Let's get started. By now, it seems like just about everyone has at least one thermal imaging camera and often several. They've become recognized as a valuable tool. The trick, of course, is to be able to interpret correctly what the tick is showing you. To be able to do that, you need to train with the tick, matching an understanding of what it does with experience in reading what it shows. My guest today writes extensively on how to use thermal imaging equipment as well as what it can and can't do. Manfred Keene is a 19-year veteran of the fire service. He served as a firefighter, captain, and chief, as well as an ambulance officer. He's been a member of Bullard's emergency responder team since 2005. Manfred is the company's fire training specialist for thermal imaging technology. He's certified through the Law Enforcement Thermographers Association as a thermal imaging instructor, and he's a recipient of the Ontario Medal for Firefighters Bravery. And Manfred Keen joins me now. Welcome to Code 3. Thank you. Thermal imaging cameras are great, but they rely on the skill of the operator So let's start with basic mistakes that some firefighters make with thermal imagers. I understand a couple of basics in thermal imaging. The fact that thermal imaging can't see through anything, and it is basically a device that senses or detects heat, or heat signatures or anomalies, if you'd like to call it. And the mistakes are by the end user or the operator of the imager who doesn't understand what we call image interpretation as to what is it that he is looking at in that imager screen. Maybe because of lack of practice, lack of knowledge, or he is scanning too quickly. I mean, we see things done by the naked eye, your brain computes it, but now you're using this device, this thermal imager, you're going into a structure for whatever it may be, and it is detecting these heat signatures or anomalies and not understanding what they are can lead to dangers, you know, misconceptions in terms of you can see through the wall or, you know, you can see through a shower curtain. I mean, there's limitations, reflections, shiny, glossy surfaces, mirrors, you know, again, stainless steel appliances can give you false images. So I, again, there's a lot of mistakes that can be made and, and, you know, it's always a, you know, the thing is practice, practice, practice. The more you use the imager, the more you practice with the imager, the more proficient you become in, in using that imager when it comes to your daily tasks as a firefighter. So with all that in mind, is there a more effective or a most effective way to train with this technology? Yeah, you know, yes, there is. I mean, there's, there's, you know, some departments are very progressive and in their, within their own training programs, they will build in sessions to allow the firefighters to understand thermal imaging a lot more. Some of the departments that I've come across for training, the imagers have basically sat in the box where the department or the chief has not allowed them to use them until they have received some sort of formal training from a company or the manufacturer, training instructor. So they're trained properly, you know, picking up an imager, taking it out of the box, pushing the on off button, you know, so that it boots up and you look at the display screen and you go, wow, this is pretty neat. Oh yeah, I can see if you, and then turn it off and okay, I I think I know what I'm doing. That's 
just not right. You're advocating then the idea that they stay in the box until people are properly trained so they won't make mistakes in the field. That's correct. I mean, those mistakes can be costly mistakes. Those mistakes can be deadly mistakes, not only to the firefighter, but to perhaps his crew. Like anything in the fire service, due diligence. I mean, we train, we train, we train. I mean, you just don't put on a breathing apparatus for the first time and say, okay, I'm good. I mean, it's practice, it's practice, it's practice. And that's what firefighters and fire departments do on a regular basis. And the thermal imager should be no different. It should be included in all aspects of training that the imager is off the apparatus, uh, out of the charger, in a firefighter's hand. And it's encompassed in all of the different aspects of training that a department goes through. What does a manufacturer, for example, do to train to illustrate to a firefighter the various different kinds of things they might see? The basics, understanding thermal imaging, the three basic colors or the three basic shades, if you want to call them, the black, white, gray scale that you know, anything that is hot, warm or hot will be white. Anything that's black will be cold or cooler and everything in between are shades of gray. And understanding that black and white gray scale is, is the utmost importance because all imagers today, depending on, it doesn't matter who the manufacturer is, have the ability to provide what's called a high heat colorization. And, um, you know, that will come on in the, you know, in the imager based on the temperature that the imager is set for. So it's important that, you know, the firefighters understand, you know, the basics of getting into the uh, colorization mode to the imager. What are a couple of tips or tricks that you have that many people don't think about that'll help them use a tick a little better? Like I said, the basics. You know, firefighters are, are included a bunch of people. They're, you know, sitting around the fire station, pick up the imager, you know, walk around the fire station. You look at your electrical panel. You know, there's little things, little smells and bells calls that you respond to where you may have a, an overheated electrical breaker or there may be an overheated ballast and a fluorescent light. Just the basics in the fire station, going around and looking at all your electrical in the fire station itself. Just again, to get you a better understanding at a benchmark, what a normal ballast would be running at for a temperature. And when you end up in a department store or a large supermarket or something that you have an overheated ballast, that you would then recognize what the temperature differentiation would be between a normal ballast and an overheated ballast or an overheated electrical breaker because there's too much of a draw. Perhaps a couple of electrical outlets that are overtaxed or overpowered. And, uh, you know, again, you could prevent a fire from happening just by the fact of understanding what it is you're looking at. There are liquid levels in containers. I mean, how many times do you respond to a structure? There's paint cans, there's jerry cans for fuel, propane tanks, or there's oxycetylene in the garage. Just looking at the liquid levels in containers. And, I mean, every fire station you go around, you probably got buckets of soap. Or, uh, you know, mechanical division, there's probably, you know, containers containing oil things like that that you can look at just to see what the liquid levels of the containers are half full, half empty. If they're empty, uh, you detect nothing. Uh, maybe the container's filled right to the very top. There needs to be an airspace in the container. So on the side of air and caution, I would say that that container is full until proven otherwise. It could be empty, but unfortunately, the imager can't give me that liquid level if the container's been filled right to the very top. So yeah, like I said, there has to be an airspace. These are little things to train with them in practice. Now, let's go back to limitations for a minute. One danger of using any tool is believing it can do more than it's designed to do. We've talked a little about limitations. I want to talk about something I saw that you had written a while back about if you're waving and you look in your imager and see somebody waving back at you the same way, the odds are it's a reflection of you. Yes. I would say that would be a reflection of yourself. If, if it's identical what you're looking at, I would say chances are that is you that you're looking at and is a reflection. And it could be from a window, could be from a mirror down the hallway, it could be from uh, a stainless steel appliance. You know, there's a lot of shiny, any shiny, glossy surface will give you that uh, reflectivity. By the same token, you pointed out that an imager can't see through things. If there is, let's say, a heat source behind that shower curtain you mentioned, will there be any indication at all, or is it simply not going to appear? Any any good quality shower curtain that you have, you know, it'd be in a hotel or it's in your own residence, 
and the person in behind. I mean, people will seek shelter. If I'm trapped in a structure and I have nowhere to go, I would, you know, obviously save a defense. I would go into my washroom, close the door, put a towel down so the smoke wouldn't get under the uh, the door, and then get into the shower and close the door or close the shower curtain. Again, just again to give me that extra line of defense until someone could come and rescue me. Well, unfortunately, if I am not actually touching the shower curtain, there's no heat transmittance going through the curtain. Therefore, firefighter comes in, scans, you know, into the washroom, sees a, a closed curtain or a closed shower door, you know, obviously can't see through it. Oh, there's nobody in here and continue on. So one of the things that we need to, you know, emphasize is that firefighters open the shower curtains, open those glass shower doors to confirm that there is nobody in behind those because we have those limitations. Now, by chance, if you happen to be leaning against the shower curtain or, you know, your hand or your shoulders up against it, yeah, you're going to get some heat transfers through that. And, you know, the firefighter will be able to pick that up. But if you're in, in no contact with the curtain, no, you're not going to be able to see through that. All right. Everyone um, from Chiefs on down hates to hear the term rekindle, mostly because it implies that the crew didn't do its job. What's the best way to use an imager to help ensure a rekindle won't happen? Again, um, like anything, take your time. Don't assume, you know, when the crew says fire is out, you've got a thermal imager. Point of origin, where did the fire start? Look around. Uh, again, any, you know, your imager has features inside temperature measurement. Uh, again, if you are looking and you're in the black and white grayscale and in the center of the screen, you've got it set across here as a little green, a little square box in the center, which is a focal point for temperature measurement. And you notice that your temperature is starting to rise as you're scanning over a particular area, then I would say you need to, you know, obviously a little more in-depth investigation to see if you actually have something that is starting to heat up, or maybe it's just the emissivity of the material that's in behind has retained heat. It's still warm and it's very slowly cooling down. Uh, again, you know, not to rush, but to, you know, scan over a particular area, maybe wait a little bit, half an hour or so, come back, check it over again, see if you have the same temperature reading. If it is increasing in temperature, then I would say, yes, you need to investigate. If the temperature is decreasing, then you know what? Leave it be. Give it some more time and come back, check it again. And if the temperature is decreasing, probably good to say that, you know, you don't have to worry about a rekindle at that point in time. But again, you know, the due diligence part is examining every area from outside of the structure to inside of the structure. If your imager has the ability to capture videos or pictures, do so. Again, that can help you if there was something to happen later on. And again, you can take that back to the station, review it, take a look at it. And if you have any question, you know, whatsoever in your mind, go back, check it out once again. And that's exactly where I was going next. If you've got an imager that can record, other than looking back to make sure that you didn't miss something, what are the other benefits of that? You know, training. Utilizing the imager in, in, in a training application, um, you know, we're going to do a, a training fire today. Unfortunately, there's only one crew that's in. Other guys are on days off or different shifts. And you know what? We, we were able to, you know, create a, a really good burn today, and we captured that on video. Now we can share that with the other crews, again, as a, as a learning curve to be able to, you know, a, a, again, having that ability to be able to share with the other department, with the other members on the department. Do you have one really good story of a save made with an imager? There's a lot of stories out there with departments. And and you know what? Yes, it's the ability today of having that, you know, the thermal imaging technology for the crew to be able to get in to do a quick size up. Again, entrance into the structure to be able to follow that flow path boom, to the seat of the fire, hit the fire, knock it down with minimal water use, minimal property damage. Without that, without that thermal imager, again, that size up, naked eye, you know, again, using your basics and understanding fire technology, fire thermal. When you're going into the structure and the firefighters are blind, you're trying to find your way through that thick smoke to find that seat of the fire. It's going to take you much longer. With thermal today, it's a lot better for the guys to be able to get in there and safer. Again, structural integrity, is the floor safe to be able to go in on? 
near the fires over top of their head, not knowing where the actual fire is. And that's what the thermal imagery is going to give them is that, you know, one of their senses, that vision dock again. And again, it's, it's all part of practice and it's not to, you know, replenish or replace anything. The firefighter was taught the basics of firefighting, but it's there to help them do their job a lot safer and a lot faster. Imagers haven't been around for all that long, but in the time they've been around, the technology has definitely improved. How would you compare the first generation of imagers to what's available now? Well, I know with Bullard, first imager being manufactured in 1998 weighed about six and a half pounds and was between twenty to twenty two thousand dollars. Yeah, between twenty two to twenty five thousand dollars, depending if the transmitter was in the handle or not and if it had the record capabilities. Six and a half pounds to twenty five thousand dollars, that's quite a lot to today where the images are down to, you know, uh, you know, about a pound, two point four pounds, something like that. The prices have definitely dropped down. And obviously the technology inside the core technology, what you see in the display screen with the colorization, with the temperature measurement. The resolution today is by far, far superior than 20 years ago when imagers were first being manufactured. Charging systems, being the charging systems as well, too. So, again, things are in batteries. Things have really come a long ways. So you're not just looking at a sort of a white blob and wondering what you're looking at. You can actually get a better idea nowadays than you could originally. Absolutely, 100%, yes. All right, man. For Keen, thanks for talking with me on Code 3 today. Thank you very much, sir, and have yourself a wonderful day. Thanks for the opportunity. Have you had any unusual experiences with your tick? Better yet, have you had any saves you can attribute to a tick? Leave your comments on our website at Code3Podcast.com slash tick. That's T-I-C. There's links to more resources there as well. And remember, this show wouldn't be possible without the support of super fans who've made a pledge at our Patreon page. Why not join them? There's nothing to it. Head over to Code3Podcast.com slash support. And remember, if you donate $10 a month or more, you'll get instant access to the Code 3 Bull Sessions. These are extra content we make available exclusively to patrons. So make your pledge today. All right, that's it. That's all for this edition of Code 3. Thank you for listening. I'll be back next time with more, and I really hope you'll be here too. I'm Scott Orr, and until then, stay safe. Code 3 is a production of Enchanted Sky Media. To contact us, get more information on today's topic, or to subscribe to the podcast, go to Code3Podcast.com.